you know, I must have met 300 people that wanted to shake my hand after I was released. And every one of them said they never thought I was guilty. You know, and, and that really amazed me because, you know, it let me know that there was a lot of people out there who knew I was innocent. I, I haven't had anyone yet to come up to me and say that I should be back in prison. You know, everybody was glad to see me out, you know, and hoping that the, you know, that the truth would finally come out. And I made promises to some relations of Kathy's, you know, that uh, I'm going to do whatever I can to do just that. And whenever I make a promise, I don't go back on it. I'll keep that promise to them. One way or another, I'm going to see the truth come out. Now, I don't only owe it to them. I think we all owe it to Kathy. You know, there was no reason at all for what happened to her. You know, I, I, you know it, it, that's something that I never could understand. You know, why? You know, it's meaningless. You know. But sooner or later, maybe we'll find out why. You know, I, I, you know, I actually wish I would have known the girl. You know, I never met the girl. You know, but you know, sitting in prison, I learned a lot about her. You know, not only from Jim, but uh, you know, you know, quite a few other people. You know, reading the state the police re investigative report, and you know talking to people that knew her, writing to them. You know, I got, to, I got to know a lot about her. You know, she seemed like a nice girl. Louis Fogel served 34 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. He was convicted of murdering Deanna Catherine Long, who was 15 years old when she was found raped and murdered in 1976 in Cherry Tree. Fogel and three others were arrested in 1981, but Louis Fogel was the only one put on trial. He has maintained that he was never present during the crime. In 2008, he convinced the Innocence Project in New York to take his case, which eventually led to his release in August 2015 based on DNA evidence. But it was the very case that put him away that kept him alive and motivated him since the day he walked into prison. It was upon the foundation of his decades of legal work that he was freed, and the knowledge of his innocence that kept him focused. Though he is technically a free man, Long's case, his case, is still what occupies his attention. If you could pick up your timeline right after your um, conviction in 1982, and um, tell us, you know, basically about your first years in prison. Mm. Hmm. That's pretty difficult. Well, right after I was con convicted, it took it, it took a quite a long time for it actually sunk in that you know that I was going to end up doing spending my life in prison for something I didn't do, you know. And I said, "Well, got to do something." But that's when I started going to the law library at at the, at the county jail, but the books was outdated, so I. Raised a little keen about it, you know, and I actually threatened to sue. And about that time, they had a flood over to the courthouse. A lot of the books got damaged, a lot of records got damaged. So they, they decided they were going to replace all the books at the law library, which helped out the, the, the county jail. They brought them over to the county jail. That gave me some good books to read. So that's why I actually started getting into the legal work. You know, he took the county jail. I would have been, I'd been ni 1983. Okay, okay, so this was right away. So you began basically working um, in legal work right away. Right. Yeah, I had to. But when you started working on it in 1983, what, what angle were you yeah. researching uh, to try to help your case? Well, at, at, that, at that point, uh, you know, DNA wasn't the way it is today. You know, but uh, I was trying to get them to run the test that they, that they ran to see if a, if a person fathered a child or not. You know, 
because I figured that would work. But then they told me, you know, during my trial and everything, they said that, what, that there was no pubic hairs on the victim other than her own. There was no DNA other than her own. Now we know there were pubic hairs that had semen on them. We, uh, you know, we also know there was semen itself, you know, not only on the pubic hairs, but on the zipper, on the jeans, and the waistband on the jeans. You know, and that DNA showed that, you know, it, you know all, all three te tests in the three different areas showed that the same three men were involved. You know, and neither one of those men was me. Now, according to Lola and Rose Long, back then, Kathy was picked up around 4 o'clock in the evening. I didn't leave my mother's place until 7 o'clock. I got up around that area, that, uh, that area at 8 o'clock, you know, which was four hours after she was abducted, you know, probably already killed, you know. It then took, you know, it then took, it took them, I think, four years to take, you know, something like that before they even, even took out and sentenced me because I traded, you know, traded one attorney in to, for another one. So we took care of, took care of the pill and stuff before, before I even went to prison, which is unusual. Uh, when, when I got down to Pittsburgh, I knew I had to make money, so I, I hurried up and made arrangements to take out and start to work down to CI, where I could make the most money. And what's the CI? Yeah. Uh, they make they made furniture and beds and stuff for the other institutions, uh, steel beds and stuff, you know. So you, know, you can take out and really make some good money down there, you know. I worked at the tag plant for a while too down there, yeah, you know, it was good money too. And so Pittsburgh was the first place that you were housed. Yes, yes. <clears throat> you had a few problems there, but not really that many, you know. Uh, one thing about prison, once they find out you fight back. They don't want to mess with you, you know, because they don't want to end up in trouble, you know. Only persons, people they go after the weak ones that will not fight back. So I lucked out there because I, you know, I don't back down, you know. So it worked out, you know. Had, had a riot down there and you know. made it through that pretty good too, you know. Where were you taken after Pittsburgh, or do you remember how long you were there for? I was down in Pitch, Pittsburgh from, uh, what the heck was it, uh, 84 to, uh, to 2004. 2004, they moved me up to Avion. And then um, that was where you had been all the way up until sort of the Innocence Project era? Uh, all, except, all except for a year. And, uh, 2008, they took out and moved, moved a bunch of inmates up to Michigan, and I, I actually was one of them. Uh, it was supposed to be for five years, but only, only lasted a year. And you know, they brought us back. They supposed to uh, give us the same job back or another job making the same money, but they didn't do it. So I was lucky because I used my money and took out and invested it. You know, and that gave me some money to live on. You know, since since 2009, though I came back, I I never had a job, mm -hmm. so I had to live off off of what I had saved up. Can you tell me a little bit about um, occupying your time while you were in prison, other than mm -hmm. working? I know you took up painting at some point. Oh well, I've actually been doing painting all my life. Okay. You know, I taught myself when I was very young, and yep. You know, other things I did. Well, I did a whole. You know, I did. I spent most of my time working on the case, doing research, typing, whatever. When know things got a little bit too too rough and things started ca caving in on me, I just knew I'd turn to my art. You know, one thing about art, you take and start a painting, six or seven hours go by and it seems like 15 minutes. So it calms you down, you know, and then you can get, you know, get back into the art or whatever I wanted to get into, or reading, you know. I, I had a habit of re reading treasure books, you know. Always wanted to take, always wanted to go out to pirate treasure and stuff. <laughs> so so I, I saw an opportunity to buy some books. So I figured, what the heck, I'll buy the books and read them. 
you said before uh, we started rolling that you kind of stuck with it because you were kind of mad about it and you knew that you had been mm -hmm. wrongfully convicted. Right. Um, does that feeling ever go away? No, never. You know, it all it does, all it does aggravate you as the years go by, especially if you have nobody on the outside working for you. You know, if you want to have family, you know, that will stop by a courthouse or make phone calls for you or, you know, mm -hmm. even write to you, you know, on a regular basis or something, you know, that, that's the only thing you got to look forward to in there, plus visits, you know. Uh, like being in Pittsburgh, you know, that's a long ways to drive. I didn't mind not having visits, but I expected to, you know, letters, you know, you know, at least maybe once a week, once every two weeks, but it didn't always turn out that way. It's every, every time a, the guard comes around with the mail and he stops at this cell, hands out mail, passes your cell, goes to the next one, hands out mail, you die just a little bit every time. You know, and I was that way for quite a few years, not getting no letters from my people. So the only thing I could do is, you know, try to find other people to write to. I think it was 2003, 2004, I took that and started trying to get the Innocence Project in Pennsylvania interested, while well, they weren't interested. So I tried doing it on my own to get DNA because, you know, because I got a copy of the State Police Investigative Report, which was something a lot of people think that you can't get. And they told me you can't get it, but I got it anyways. But I noticed in there that there were indications of, you know, different DNA that was found. So I, I decided, you know, I, I, I decided uh, instead of just sending my paperwork, you know, to the Innocence Project and say, here it is, you know, I decided to, to sort of use a different tactic. I wrote it up as if I was writing a brief. And it, everything I said, I made sure I added some kind of a, a record to show that I was telling the truth on it, you know, to, in order to support it. And uh, at that time, in, in New York, there was an uh, attorney in the Innocence Project, uh, Greg Cooley. And uh, he, he, read, he read my paperwork, you know. And he took the case, he told me, he says, e you know, even if your case did not have DNA in it, he said, I would have had to take your case because you, pro you proved to me not only that you're innocent, but you that you were set up. You make contact with the Innocence Project and things are, things are starting to look good. What, yeah. are you, what are you feeling? Are you feeling optimism? Are you trying to check your, <laughs> your hopes? <laughs> yeah, well, that was, that was strange because I, I have seen light at the end of the tunnel uh, quite a few times. I, I, I was glad whenever I called my attorney and she says, I've got some good news for you, you know. You know, well, it wasn't actually my attorney. I talked to one of the law students, you know, and she, she told me they, they found some DNA and they're searching for more. And they were going to test it, you know. And uh, she said, uh, i got to ask you, is there any way this DNA can match up to you? And I said, absolutely not. You know, I wasn't even in an area where the crime was committed, you know. So he, he ran it and showed him exactly what I told him. Yeah, it, uh, you know, it was the first time I had attorneys in the case where, I, where what, what, you know, what they were doing and planning to do was in harmony with what I was doing and trying to do. You know, and that helped out a heck of a lot. You know, you know I, I really owe my life to them. You know, it did me justice anyways. You know, there's so many guys in, in prison that, uh, you know, get to, the, you know, get to the point where they have nowhere to turn, and a lot of them commit suicide. You know, I thought about it myself. You know, quite a few times, but every time, you know, every time I'd get a letter from Barbara or somebody, you know, and, you know, Once, once I get the letter, I'd, I'd snap back to reality again. 
you know, and realize that if I did something like that, it's over. You know, it's completely over. I lost, they won. And there was no way I could let them win. You know, for all the illegal things that led to my, my arrest and conviction, I couldn't let them win. I had to win this one. So I kept on fighting. So would it be fair to say that perhaps your very innocence is what saved your life right. when you were in prison? Definitely. If I, if I was guilty, I, I, I would have done myself in. This whole, this, this whole case just never made sense from the start. You know, it was crazy. But whenever, whenever they told, you know, start telling me about, well, we found this, we found that, you know, and they were, they were, they were surprised about my attitude. On I didn't show any emotion. I didn't show any excitement. And the reason I didn't is because, the, you know, I've seen light at the end of the tunnel so many times it was yanked away, you know. And then finally, you know, it came, you know, to finally the results came back, you know. Then I knew once they came back that this time I'm going to make it. There's no way no one could yank the rope out from underneath me. That was the time to take out and get excited. But I really, I still never really showed emotion or anything until the day of the last hearing. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I owe my, I owe my thanks to not, not only to you know, not only the attorney. You know, you know, Karen Thompson's a great lady. You know, yeah, uh, she put what I, what I had with what, she, what they had, put it together and stuff. But the students that I, that I've worked with, you know, over all these years. We have come so close, <laughs> so close together, like, like a family. You know, you know, we not only kicked this case around, we kicked the law itself around. You know, and these are large students. You know, a uh, few things they even had to go and ask the professors to find out if I was right on. You know, find out I was. You know, uh, I had one of them to, to, told me that. Uh, you know, uh, she didn't think she'd pass some of her finals if it wasn't for me kicking things around with her. You know, she was really, you know, they, I don't know, they seemed amazed that, you know, of my knowledge, you know, whenever it comes to the law and stuff, you know. But, um, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think, you know, you know, they keep on taking it and telling me that, you know, if it wasn't for what I did, you know, you know, on the case, you know, well, if it wasn't for what they did in the case, it wouldn't have came together either. You know, they're, they're good people, you know. You know, I, I like working with the law, you know. I like, like to have it in my life somehow, but I'd also like to get up into the mountains for a while too, and my, my Attorney says, well, that's running away. It's not running away. You know, you find serenity out there in those mountains. You know, it's a good place to go to just to get your head back together and get to know yourself again. And that's what I wanted to do. You know, I didn't even want to stay here in Pennsylvania. That's how bad I hate this state. You know, if, if I had the money to where I could go somewhere else, and be whatever I want to be, I wouldn't be here now. I'd be gone. But with being here, I'm bound and determined. I'm going to find out what really happened to Kathy. You know, I'm going to find out who's responsible, and I'm going to see them in prison. You know, and I'm going to set through the trial. I want to see them convicted. <laughs>